Right, okay. Welcome to all participants and to Lin Li Ching for the fifth webinar in our series on gene drives. We have had four webinars over the past two weeks um, introducing the technology and other aspects of it. Um, I'll briefly summarize them in a minute. Um, then there's a few technical remarks for you and then I'll introduce Ching. Um, these, web these webinars are organized by four organizations of independent scientists, one on the European level, that's the one I work for, the European Network of Scientists for Social and Environmental Responsibility, NSEF. There's a German one, the Federation of German Scientists, a Swiss one, the Critical, um, Critical Scientists Switzerland, and the French one, Science Citoyenne. Three of these four ran um, a research project over the past two or three years and wrote a report about gene drives, which we published last summer, a year ago, and presented it at a symposium in Bern in Switzerland. And the speakers of our webinars are actually some of the authors of the report. When I look at the previous webinars, the first one by Ricardo Steinbrecher from Econexis was about what gene drives are actually. They are a new form of genetic modification that genetically modifies entire populations of a plant or an animal. So not just one animal or plant, but whole populations at a time. That has been made possible largely by uh, the development of a new technology of genetic engineering, CRISPR-Cas, quite well known, appears in the paper a lot. Um, but an important thing to say is that no gene drives have actually been released in the wild yet. Some are being developed, but most ideas about them are only that yet, just ideas. But a lot of thinking work is being done about it and a lot of preparatory lab work as well. There are a lot of limitations and uncertainties, Ricardo explained, um, particularly on the molecular level, particularly due to this technique of CRISPR-Cas, which is by far not as exact as its users like to make us believe, but also ecologically, uh, gene drives potentially um, have such a large influence on the ecosystem in which they are intended to be used that they may have all sorts of side effects. You can imagine that not just the targeted population will react, but also um, its enemies and every everything, every plant or animal that interacts with this population. So we need to find out about that. And the dilemma of gene drives is that it is impossible really to test them properly before releasing them because they're meant to be used in the wild. And if you're releasing for any test that is already an exploitation, you're using them. So that is a big dilemma. And as Ricardo said, even if they work as intended, it doesn't mean it isn't a problem. But even if they do not work as intended, it still doesn't mean it isn't, it isn't a problem. The second webinar was by Mark Wells, also from Econexis, and written about the applications, what are gene drives being used for. Um, the main research work is with insects and fungi, moles. Um, it is highly uncertain, he said, if gene drives can be made to work in mammals and even more so in plants. People want to, for instance, for mice, rats or starlings that are invasive species here and there in the world. Um, but they haven't proven that it is possible yet. With mosquitoes, um, they are the furthest, uh, that is, a gene drive being developed to eradicate malaria in mosquito populations and 
the people who, want, who are doing that want to test it in Burkina Faso in Africa, but they haven't started with the tests yet. Uh, there are, this is a disease application, um, uh, interrupting disease transmission. There are also agricultural applications for pest control. I shouldn't say there are. Um, people want to develop gene drives for such applications. And as I also said already, for the control of invasive species. That was the main bit of Mark's webinar. Then came Tamara Leeprecht of the Scientist Switzerland, who talked about the social aspects. Um, one of the things she said was that there is an increased reliance on money, on private investment. Uh, and the main two investors are not big companies, but a very big foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and a big government institution from the United States, DARPA, which really is the American army. Um, the financial ties of the scientists who do it uh, may jeopardize the independence of their research, which is a very important point, because um, gene drives can, are potentially so powerful that it is really important to include the people affected by them when they would be applied. Prior and informed consent is what we call that. Um, people should be informed and they should be consulted. They should really have the right to decide. The precautionary principle, Tamara said, also applies to gene drives. That principle says that if there is any reasonable indication that harm may arise, governments should take measure to prevent or um, abolish such harm and with gene drives there are plenty of indications that such harm might arise uh, so governments would do well to apply the precautionary principle and not allow any gene drives to be released as yet until much more research has been done into them there's a lot of hype around gene drives particularly because of the technique of crispr cas of which um, many claims are made but most gene drives do not exist yet. So the claims are very often exaggerated. And maybe the most important thing that Tamara said was, uh, we should change the starting point. We shouldn't take the technology as a starting point and think if we should use it, we should take the problem as a starting point. What problem are we wanting to solve in each case? What is the question we're asking and what are the potential answers? What are what technologies or what other means of solving this problem are already existing or are in development? And then the people concerned should decide which route to follow, which means to use. The fourth webinar was by Christopher Preston from the United States, Montana University, if I'm correct. Um, about the ethical aspects of gene drives. He said there are three ways basically that you can look at gene drives from a moral point of view. You can try and weigh the benefits and the harms against each other. Um, that points you, for instance, to the fact that there's a lot of uncertainty about them, as Ricardo had already explained. So it's difficult to make a good decision from that perspective from that through that lens if you look through that lens he called them three lenses benefits and harm is one lens the second lens he mentioned is justice are there any constraints from the point of view of fairness justice and that points you for instance to the fact that uh, people should have self-determination that the people concerned the people affected by gene drives should be able to decide whether they want them or not and a third lens, a third ethical lens through which you could look at gene drives is the worldview or the attitude of the people who develop them. Um, is that what you want to use in practice? And that tells you, for instance, that gene drives will be promoting a synthetic age 
as Christopher called it, an age in which we try to solve everything by synthetic means, by technofixes. Gene drives deserve close, inclusive and transparent ethical scrutiny, as Christoph, Christopher said. But the dilemma, and this mainly came up during the question and answer session of that webinar, was that you cannot really impose ethics upon technology development. That is a big problem. Norway has made a good effort. They have uh, a genetic engineering law which gives the government the opportunity to use ethical considerations, but it's an opportunity. The government is not obliged. And also it doesn't prescribe what kind of ethical considerations the government should use. But there are a lot of different ethical considerations. So this is a dilemma. Ethical ethics should really rule or govern techno technology developments like that of gene drives, but you can't impose it upon it. It's very important that we think about the ethical aspects, but it's even more important that somebody does it, that somebody steps in and makes them rule the technology development. And that can only be any person who is concerned in the development of a specific gene drives a specific gene drive. Right, sorry for taking so long, but uh, we had four gene drives before this one, so that's a lot to summarize. I've been very brief. Um, a technical point for the participants. Um, we keep your webcams switched off, unfortunately. Um, that's purely to save energy. Digital activities take a lot of energy, and this is our little contribution to save energy. You can ask questions. Um, you need to write them down. Uh, if you look at the bottom of your Zoom window, you see a Q&A button. If you press that, you'll be able to write a question there. We collect the questions from this box and Ching will answer them at the end of our talk. Um, we want you to mention your name when you ask a question. If you have registered with your name, then it will automatically appear with your question. But if you have not, then we would still like you to mention your name with the question. We're not answering anonymous questions. This is a practice at physical conferences, which we think is a very good, respectful practice. And we think it's even more important in online events like this. It's also a policy of our organizations, because respect is part and parcel of critical science. We are in the process of putting the recordings of these websites, of these webinars online. They will appear on the website genedrives.ch, where you can also find the report on that project I mentioned. Um, they will not appear immediately, but the previous ones have been prepared in the meantime, and Lucas, I think, will put them online, the ones that are ready. Uh, he will put them online any moment now. But Chains, of course, will appear a bit later. Um, for privacy reasons, I shall not read out your name when I read out your question. I shall read your questions at the end and Ching will answer them but I shall not call out your name because this recording will be put online. And privacy law in the EU demands that we will get your written permission if we say your name in that case. So to avoid this, we don't mention your name, but we want to see it. I think that is most of what I should say. Lucas, I don't know if you want to say anything yet about putting the recordings online, do you? No. You don't? Okay. Well, this can be nice and brief. Um, that leaves me to introduce Ching then. Limli Ching has studied ecology and development studies and she is currently senior researcher at the Third World Network, 
TWN, which is an international NGO based in Malaysia. But Ching lives in London, lives and works for TWN in London. Um, and she coordinates the biosafety and sustainable agriculture programs of Third World Network. She is also, that's very relevant for the topic of gene drives, a member of two technical expert groups of the United Nations, one under the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety, which concerns GMOs, genetically engineered organisms. That's the technical expert group on socioeconomic considerations about GMOs. And the other one is under the Convention on Biological Diversity, and that's the technical expert group on synthetic biology, which is a concept that includes gene drives. And she's also a member of the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems. That's also the United Nations, is it, Ching? It's not. Oh. Well, it's a global body anyway. Um, that was all. I'd like to give the word to Ching with this. Ching, please take the screen, not the floor, but the screen. Thank you very much, uh, Deirdre. I will uh, share my screen with her, which has the presentation and I've been asked to turn off my camera so I'll say hi to everyone now and then I'll turn off my camera just because um, in, in terms of uh, connections and you know clarity of uh, um, the sound and all that so I'll do that in a bit when I share my screen. Okay, I hope you can all see the screen fine. And that's, uh, yeah. Um, so I've been asked to talk about the legal and regulatory aspects of gene drives. Uh, and this is, is, of course, as mentioned by Deirdrick, uh, a result of uh, some research and um, writing work we did a couple of years ago um, and published last year, um, published by three of the scientific organizations, the independent scientific organizations that are organizing this seminar, ANSA, Critical Scientists, it's a and the uh, Federation of German Scientists. Um, so just to, to give you the context of what we were looking at and the scope of uh, the work we did, uh, these were the questions that we had looked at answering in terms of what are the relevant international and other legal and regulatory instruments and processes relevant to gene drives and gene drive organisms. Uh, we looked particularly um, at the Convention on Biological Diversity and two of its protocols, the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety and the Nagoya Kuala Lumpur uh, Supplementary Protocol on Liability and Redress. Uh, I'll say a bit more about these uh, treaties uh, when, when I, later on the presentation, uh, but really it was to see if there were gaps in the international regulatory framework, particularly around these three treaties. And finally, to ask the question of what is needed for a legal and regulatory biosafety regime that is actually suited to gene drive organisms. Now, I mean, we know that, and you know, by definition, gene drive organisms uh, are defined as genetically modified organisms, uh, and therefore they do actually come under regulation, whether it's international uh, or uh, transnational biosafety laws. Uh, then the question is then what makes gene drive organisms different, uh, such that we have to look closely at the legal and regulatory aspects. I think firstly, it's the fact that they are designed to spread and persist in populations. Uh, and in this case, uh, and, and, and throughout the, the whole of our chapter, we had the case of global gene drives in mind. That is the gene drives that, are, um, that will spread to all populations that are connected by gene flow. Uh, and also which are, you know, the subject of uh, a lot of research and attention, for example, uh, for the gene drives that are go, um, planned um, and, and research uh, in terms of the mosquitoes uh, for malaria eradication. And what happens is that these results in permanent modification uh, of a population or potential eradication. In many cases, uh, the effects will be irreversible. Now, this, of course, is different from the genetically modified organisms uh, with which we've, uh, the world has dealt with so far. Uh, because in many cases with GM crops, for example, um, the idea is not that you want them to spread uh, and persist, but uh, that you want to actually restrict gene flow, you risk assess for that, you risk mitigate for that. Uh, 
But this is a very different case where gene-derived organisms are actually designed purposefully to spread and persist. Um, secondly is the fact that um, the G GMOs to date, um, they are developed in the lab and then released into the environment. Our experience so far has been largely with GM crops in cultivated fields. Um, but as mentioned by Deirdrick, and I'm sure if you had followed the earlier webinars uh, would have been talked about, is that gene drive organisms actually convert the fuel into the lab because the genetic engineering machinery, such as CRISPR-Cas, uh, is carried uh, and, and passed on uh, through generations uh, in the field. So right now, our space for experiment is no longer the lab, but the environment, if it's out in the environment. And this, um, as Cedric mentioned, is about moving into wild populations and ecosystems. And of course, this raises uh, many complex issues, the complexity of the affected systems and ecosystems that are potentially affected, the potential impacts uh, that they could have. All these increases scientific uncertainty and actually requires more precautionary approaches to regulation. And of course, so then there are regulatory challenges when we talk about gene drives uh, because of the specific nature, uh, which raise complex legal and regulatory issues. Uh, as I mentioned, gene drive organisms are genetically modified organisms and they are regulated then under biosafety laws. The question is whether these current laws are fully equipped to address the specific challenges that gene drives and G GDOs raise. Uh, and I think you will find as I go along in the presentation that we find that uh, no, they're not quite uh, fully equipped to address these challenges and therefore we need fit for purpose regulations of gene drive organisms, which of course build on the biosafety regulations of, for GMOs. Uh, we need legally binding rules uh, because um, while it's well and good to have principles for gene drive research or guidance documents uh, for, for research or, or risk assessment, if we don't have legally binding rules in place, we cannot depend on self-regulation uh, by scientists or researchers or developers uh, to, to, to ensure that uh, the safety to health and to the environment um, is, is upheld. And I think we can just look at the case of the genome editor twins, for example. Well, well, there was a, you know, a, a scientific uh, consensus, you could say, uh, that, they, that they would not work on uh, genome editing the germline of humans. This happened nevertheless, and we've had a set of twins born and others on the way, um, which shows that there's just been a failure of dependence on self-regulation. So we are calling, of course, for legally binding rules uh, that are specific and that specifically address the challenges uh, that gene drive organisms pose. Uh, the rules also need to be international because there are transboundary issues involved. Because particularly when you look at global gene drives, um, which can spread to all populations connected by gene flow, these are no respecter of national boundaries. So there will be transboundary issues. In many cases, it's intentional, as in the case of the gene drive mosquitoes, that they are meant uh, to be, you know, to spread fully. Uh, in other cases, it could be unintentional where an escape uh, could lead to transboundary movement. So in both cases, in any case, uh, we can't depend on a patchwork of national laws, but we need to have international rules in place. Um, we looked at um, various instruments uh, which were relevant, which we thought were relevant uh, to gene drives and gene drive organisms. I'm not going to go through the details of all of this. Uh, but just to say, uh, you know, to look at some of the clusters of the treaties that we looked at. The first one, uh, the first grouping, of course, was the Convention on Biological Diversity and two of its protocols, the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety and a supplementary protocol to the Biosafety Protocol, which is the supplementary protocol on liability and redress. Um, now, all these, these three treaties uh, uh, look at the impact uh, of uh, on conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. Um, the convention itself and the Cartagena Protocol have a near universal membership and um, they have already actually began to address gene drive organisms in their substantive work. So for example, under the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, it has been discussing the issue of synthetic biology for almost a decade now. Uh, and they have looked specifically in the last uh, several years at gene drive organisms. Uh, they've taken decisions in relation to gene drive organisms uh, and the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety 
and the Nagoya Kuala Lumpur Supplementary Protocol on Liability and Redress, then subject matter uh, are GMOs or LMOs as they're called in these protocols. And that includes gene drive organisms. So very clearly, uh, gene drive organisms fall within their scope. The Cartagena Protocol has started to look at risk assessment issues in relation to gene drive organisms. Uh, and so the work is ongoing. Uh, in, in these uh, three, uh, well, at least for the Convention and the Cartagena Protocol. Uh, we also looked at uh, three, what I would call more trade-related uh, uh, legal instruments, the WTO Agreement on Sanitary and Phytosanitary Measures, uh, the International Plant Protection Convention, and the World Organization for Animal Health Standards. Now, the standards and any guidance set up by these latter two uh, um, bodies are uh, actually recognized in the SPS agreement, which is an agreement of the World Trade Organization. Um, so they are recognized as standard setting bodies and therefore whatever it is that they may address in relation to um, gene drive organisms could be important. However, at this stage, uh, because there, there is no commercial trade in gene drive organisms, unlike the trade that we currently have with GM crops, for example, uh, they are at currently uh, of limited relevance uh, to gene drive organisms, right? Um, the other uh, cluster of uh, treaties that we looked at was the uh, Biological Weapons Convention and the Environmental Modification Convention. Now, these are two legally binding instruments uh, that basically uh, prohibit hostile and military use of uh, biological agents in the case of the Biological Weapons Convention. Uh, in the case of NMOD or the Environmental Modification Convention, it prohibits the hostile or military use of any techniques that could be classified as environmental modification and gene drive organisms uh, would, could certainly meet this criteria. Uh, and this becomes very important because, of course, many of these technologies uh, do have dual use. They can be used for peaceful purposes, but they also could have military applications. Um, so it was important to look at these treaties uh, and to, to, to assess where they are on, on these issues. Um, there has been some discussion on gene drive organisms uh, under the Biological Weapons Convention, but I think with these two treaties, the main um, uh, drawbacks or the main limitations that we found is that really the lack of political will uh, by the parties to the treaties to actually implement effective uh, mechanisms to address the issues is not there. Uh, so that there are, of course, limitations. Um, we also looked at the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Now, um, this has become particularly important in the context of the issue of the need to obtain free, prior and informed consent uh, from Indigenous peoples and local communities as recognised in the CBD uh, before any uh, projects or any uh, interventions or release uh, of gene drive organisms uh, into their lands and territories or, or, or that could affect their resources. Now the UN declaration, like all UN declarations, are not legally binding instruments, uh, but it has been um, agreed and endorsed by 150 members of the UN General Assembly. Uh, and it, it sets up an international standard and uh, international norm and becomes a universal framework of minimum standards. Um, wherein free, prior and informed consent is an established right. Um, so, and I will talk a little bit more about this um, later in the talk because uh, this is an important aspect of where the current governance uh, of gene drive organisms uh, stands. And finally, we also uh, looked at this um, WHO published guidance framework for testing of GM mosquitoes. Uh, it was published quite some time ago and it's focused specifically on GM mosquitoes. It's important to note that this is not an international uh, intergovernmental uh, process that developed this guidance framework, what was uh, developed by experts on the issue. Nevertheless, they had many very useful um, 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 guidance that was brought up in there, but we also felt that there were uh, flaws in its approaches to gene drive mosquitoes. Um, the other issue that we looked at quite closely was uh, the issue of regulation of contained use. Now, as Diedrich mentioned, uh, there are no gene drive organisms that are currently, that have been released into the environment. They are all currently at research stage in laboratories, but then this makes the idea of contained use particularly important. Now, contained use is basically the idea that you uh, prevent uh, contact with the environment and so that you limit any impact on the environment. 
And this normally is carried out uh, with could be, uh, research in laboratories, perhaps on the greenhouses. But there has to be a degree of physical uh, containment. Uh, maybe at times you could have molecular or biological containment, but that the physical um, measures that are put in place will actually prevent contact in the environment to the environment, uh, coupled with um, personnel um, practices, right? So lab workers, for example, the protocols they follow, how do they deal with these organisms? That would be very important. But we find uh, in our review of contained use that actually um, the risk of accidental escape uh, is high. And this is even true for labs which have very high safety standards. And recent examples I can mention, for example, uh, in recent years, uh, we've had incidences at very high security labs. Uh, for example, um, the accidental distribution of um, pandemic influenza viruses from the US um, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the US uh, CDC. Uh, we have had uh, incidences of improperly stored vials of virus smallpox samples uh, at the U.S. National Institutes of Health. Uh, and of course, many people remember the anthrax, uh, the accidental distribution of anthrax, uh, uh, which came from basically a very high security uh, military lab. So accidental escape is always an issue uh, when we talk about contained use, particularly contained use of, uh, in these examples, pathogens, uh, where that happens or that could happen. Uh, and that becomes important when we talk about gene drives because even a small unintentional release, if it's a global gene drive, of only a few organisms can likely result in extensive spread. Uh, and this could also go beyond national borders. So I think this is an area that we found uh, really needs to uh, come under close scrutiny. Now, a GMO that is destined for contained use uh, is subject to provisions of the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety. Uh, but a lot of the, the policy space is left to the national governments. So national standards are particularly important uh, in regard to contained use. But the question is then, the question we asked was whether is this adequate for gene drive organisms where you do have uh, you know, particular characteristics like the potential to spread um, or to potentially eradicate populations. Uh, are these national standards adequate to deal uh, with uh, gene drive organisms? And finally, there are no international continuous regulations for GMOs. There are some guidelines, for example, published by the WHO or the um, US Department of, of Human Health Services, um, which are more or less taken as the effect of international standards. But there's nothing legally binding, no, nothing legally binding internationally uh, for GMOs or for lab safety. And there's none specific for GD, um, the risk of gene drive organisms. So we found this to be a particularly uh, big gap that needs to be addressed. Um, so from the review that we did, um, when we looked at all these various legal instruments and regulatory processes, uh, we, we found that, okay, there are existing international instruments that relate to various aspects of gene drive governance, but there are gaps in their coverage as well in addressing the specific challenges. Uh, and, we concluded that the CBD and its, uh, the two protocols, the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety and the, um, the Supplementary Protocol on Liability and Redress, they can really offer the most comprehensive international structure. They are already dealing with the issue of GDOs. They have started to address the issue through some of the decision and work that is going on intersessionally. Um, and there is opportunity, for example, to, to explicitly locate broader governance of gene drive organisms under the CBD and specific regulatory governance to the Cartagena Protocol with the supplementary protocol addressing liability issues because that, of course, is, is subject matter. Um, but then there are still limitations that need to be addressed, but including in the area of contained use. Um, of course, when the CBD uh, you know, was... Uh, adopted in 1992, the Cartagena Protocol came into force in 2001. That's about you know, more than 20 years ago uh, when these treaties were drafted. So they were, did not necessarily um, you know, have the, the, the full spectrum of risks, for example, that gene drive organisms could pose in mind. They were not specifically drafted uh, for the specific um, design of gene drive organisms uh, to spread and persist. They were designed, especially the Cartagena Protocol, focusing very much on genetically modified 
organisms. So then we need to really look at how the provisions of these protocols of the CBD can become actively responsive to the specificities and risks of gene derived organisms. Then we also have, um, we need to step up efforts to ensure the implementation of and compliance with the CBD and its protocols are improved because there's a lot of room for improvement. And at the same time, there's a need for work in other fora and on other instruments to address specific aspects of GDO regulation. And this could be, for example, uh, if we talk about dual use, that would come under the purview, uh, definitely within the mandate of the Biological and Toxins Weapons Convention. Um, so I think we are still very far from an over, overview of an a robust uh, international regulatory system that is able to adequately regulate um, the risks and adequately regulate gene drive organisms. Um, I want to turn to in my next, the next part of my presentation to just identify some of the key elements uh, that we thought would be important uh, of a legal and regulatory regime for gene drive organisms. Um, firstly to say, and I think this has already been mentioned by Diedrich, uh, you know, very much so both the CBD and the Cartagena protocol, uh, you know, they operate uh, the principles of precaution, the precautionary principle, and the polluter pace principle uh, very much underpin them, right? Um, and as uh, Deirdre mentioned, the precautionary principle is, uh, you know, in cases of where there's scientific uncertainty, where there is some indication of harm, where governments can actually take action uh, to mitigate the harm, right? And it actually guides environmental decision making under conditions of uh, places responsibility of those producing the pollution to pay for damage to the environment and human health. And this is very much tied up tied to uh, the concept of liability and redress as well. Um, so really, uh, we would say that in any regulatory regime uh, that addresses gene drive organisms, really these two principles need to be operationalized. And the purpose is to avoid harm, to take anticipa anticipatory action to prevent that harm, and to ensure at the end of the day that there is justice for victims of harm if damage occurs. Um, so I just want to, I think I have eight elements to go through um, to just say that these were the ones we flagged as we thought, what we thought were particularly important when thinking about legal and regulatory aspects of gene drive organisms. The first one was the need for strict contained use standards. As, as I mentioned previously, there is no standardized application of contained use standards to current um, R&D of gene drive organisms, nor are there any internationally agreed regulations specific to GDOs. In contained use. Uh, so we feel that that's a big gap and that effort has to be made at the international level to, to start to address this. Um, well, we don't have to start from nowhere in a sense because we can look at uh, contained use standards that have already been developed uh, for pathogens. Uh, usually these are, for example, infectious, uh, for infectious diseases or microbes, right? Uh, and there are some standards in place that we can draw from in the EU. For example, there is a regulation on genetically modified um, micro, microorganisms that, that also has very useful elements that we can take from. Uh, but I think there, there are parallels because um, with gene drive uh, organisms, uh, if they are designed to eradicate populations or they're capable of introducing uh, lethal threats, for example, then uh, this requires higher contained stringency. When we look at contained use of pathogens, uh, the more dangerous a pathogen is, the more ability to be infectious, uh, perhaps uh, the ability to spread easily, the ability to, um, uh, or to, should I say, the inability to recall or to remove it from the environment. Uh, this means that the standards that are applied to containment have to be more strict. And we feel that a similar thing should apply uh, to gene drive organisms. And particularly those that are designed to introduce the nitrious or lethal traits uh, should be subject to higher containment stringency. At the same time, at the national level, uh, as I mentioned earlier, contained use standards are, are very much applied at the national level uh, within biosafety laws. Uh, so one, uh, one way forward we thought that could be useful would be that when governments require licensings 
licensing of experiments with gene drive organisms in contained use. Uh, this would allow them at least to have some appropriate oversight, to be cognizant of the kind of research and development that's happening in the country, uh, the ability to um, you know, revoke licenses if conditions aren't met with, for example. And this would be an important step uh, to do at the same time as, as the international community discusses uh, international standards for gene drive organisms. Uh, the second uh, key point that we uh, thought was important was the idea of joint decision making. Now we know with gene drive organisms, uh, it could either be intentionally uh, that you do have transboundary movements or unintentionally when an escape occurs and it crosses national borders. So transboundary movement very much will happen with gene drive organisms. Um, joint decision making that we are talking about here is not about a regional entity making a decision on behalf of countries in that region. But it's about giving every country the right to either give or withhold approval for gene drive organism release in another jurisdiction that could directly or indirectly impact its territory. Now under the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety, this principle of prior informed consent is already required before any first transboundary movement of a GMO for intentional introduction into the environment. This is carried out on a bilateral basis. For example, uh, if my country, Malaysia, uh, wants to import a GM crop from another country that is party to the protocol, for example, China or Brazil, uh, the exporter or the exporting authority would have to seek my country's prior informed consent before they can do that. But this is done on a bilateral basis. When we talk about gene drive organisms, and if we talk about a region, for example, if, it is, if, if it's continent-wide uh, or regional-wide in the case of a gene drive organism that could spread uh, into many different territories, we would then need to consider extended modalities uh, for gene drive organisms to allow a wider number of parties to be involved in the decision. We also need to reconsider when and where uh, consent is exercised because at the moment, if a country wants to export uh, a GM crop to another country, it then seeks the prior informed consent of the importing country only at the point when it wants to export it. But in the case of gene drive organisms, if a country were to proceed with a domestic release, uh, it is at that point before they do that domestic release that they will have to already seek the consent of other countries in the region where there's a likelihood that transboundary movement could occur into. So not at the point of crossing the border, but at the point of domestic release. Uh, and this has to be done in advance, of course. So I think these are modalities uh, which have not even been discussed yet under the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety or the Convention on Biological Diversity. And we need to think creatively about how we can apply uh, the principles already set up in the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety uh, to gene drive organisms. Um, and of course, because gene drive organisms are amenable to unintentional transboundary movements, whether it's from contained use or from a domestic release, we then need effective measures for dealing with unintended transboundary movements. Uh, the Cartagena Protocol does have provisions dealing with uh, unintentional and illegal transboundary movements, but these are quite limited. Uh, you know, it's a process that involves notification to pot potentially affected states, uh, providing uh, information in a timely manner and consulting uh, with these potentially affected parties. And these are all necessary steps, but they need to be further strengthened. Uh, particularly in, in the case of uh, gene drive organisms, uh, you know, for example, do we need systems um, like rapid alert systems? Or do we need registers where we are able to know where uh, work is being done, where research is being done, uh, and wh who are the potentially affected countries from unintentional transboundary movements, for example. So all these things are not in place yet, neither have they been discussed under the Cartagena Protocol, even though we do have provisions that deal with this and that could be uh, adopted or adapted to be able to, uh, to, to deal with this um, problem of, or this issue of gene drive organisms. The fourth um, issue that we felt was an important element, and I think this has come out uh, in, in, in the other webinars as well, is the need for genuine public participation and free prior and informed consent. 
uh, we have in the Cartagena Protocol articles uh, that do deal with these issues. Um, um, participation, for example, whereby access to information, participation in decision making and access to justice are central pillars, right? There are other examples. Examples, uh, for example, the Aarhus Convention um, that deals with uh, all these issues uh, for the European region and beyond. Um, that that would be important uh, standards that we could look at and to to design and to say what's important for uh, the case of gene drive organisms. Um, in terms of the issue of free prior and informed consent, this has already been discussed quite extensively uh, within the, the expert groups of the CBD and parties in 2018 actually preconditioned um, free prior and informed consent or the national equivalent. You'll see different um, terms being used here, but the main idea is that there has to be free prior informed consent uh, sought or obtained uh, from potentially affected indigenous peoples and local communities before any introduction into the environment of gene drive organisms. Now, there are no international guidelines yet on this issue, uh, but of course, as I mentioned, there, is, there are international norms and standards set by the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and the CBD itself has adopted a voluntary guide guideline called the Moat's Kut Style Voluntary Guideline that deals with the issue of free prior and informed consent when um, accessing uh, the traditional knowledge of indigenous peoples and local communities. So there are details and standards within these instruments that could be considered uh, and developed uh, to apply specifically for gene drive organisms and there's opportunity there to be able to do that. Um, fifthly, another very important issue, um, I think this would have been covered in the first two webinars on the scientific and aspects and the application uh, of uh, gene drives. Uh, as we know that uh, gene drive organisms have novel features making them distinct from current GMOs and therefore posing challenges for risk assessment. Um, there has been a technical expert group uh, on risk assessment uh, that's been set up under the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety. They met earlier this year in an online manner and they have recommended actually that guidance uh, for risk assessment uh, for gene drive organisms uh, should be developed. And I think part of the discussion was really a lot about we need to be able to also acknowledge that there are limitations and uncertainties. There could be data limitations, for example, if we don't have enough information in terms of the ecosystems that are going to be affected by gene drive organisms. There could be also methodological limitations. Uh, for example, can you use the approach um, which you do for G, uh, GMOs, uh, where you move from the lab to a field trial to an open release. In the case of gene drive organisms, as Jedrick mentioned right at the start, a field release, a small release, is already an environmental release because of its uh, capacity to spread. So how do we then deal with this that we cannot actually carry out and perform a risk assessment to as particularly to detect for unintended effects uh, and what do we do when this risk assessment is not possible? How do we then acknowledge and how do we guide decision making? Uh, it could be in some um, researchers that propose that if there are certain criteria, what they call cutoff criteria uh, that are met, uh, where for example we know we cannot control gene drive organisms spatially and temporally, then the, the result of this then is to say that, well, we can't, we can't do this, we can't control it, and therefore the safest and less risky option is not to release any such organism. Uh, and these are things that have to be discussed and uh, um, very fully and robustly. And we've come to the stage now where the expert group has recommended the guidance, that guidance be developed, uh, and it's up to parties to the Cartagena Protocol uh, to consider uh, when they next meet, which could would likely be next year because of the postponements um, of, of many meetings at this stage in time, but then they will have to consider whether we need additional guidance materials and what the parameters are, what are the scope, what are the questions that need to be asked when we come to talk about gene drive organisms. So all this is also again uh, very much up for discussion um, and, and deliberation at this point in time. Um, I'm looking at uh, the sixth point here, uh, which was about socioeconomic impacts. 
Now, as I mentioned, the Cartagena Protocol uh, establishes the right, it has provisions that deal with socioeconomic considerations, and it establishes the right of parties to take these into account uh, when making decisions. Uh, but those of you who know the Cartagena Protocol, uh, it's actually a weak provision and it uh, doesn't amount to requiring or conducting socioeconomic impact assessments. At the same time, we know that gene drive organisms do have broad socioeconomic and ethical implications, and these need to be properly assessed. Now, how do we do this when we take decisions on gene drive organisms? This is absolutely a critical aspect of their governance. Uh, there is an expert, uh, technical expert group on socioeconomic considerations uh, that has been set up under the Cartagena Protocol. It has produced some guidance, which is a framework guidance. Uh, it's very broad and we're still deliberate. I mean, um, there's still many discussions to be had on this. So it's very pre preliminary at this stage. Um, they have not yet specifically applied this guidance uh, to gene drive organisms or to consider if there are you know, special considerations that need to be taken into account for gene drive organisms. So even in the case of GMOs, uh, it, it is quite preliminary and at the beginning stage, much less so when we come to talk about gene drive organisms. So this is the current status uh, under the Cartagena Protocol uh, when it comes to socioeconomic considerations. Um, I think um, it was also mentioned earlier, I think um, in terms of that we need to look at different alternatives. And we feel that neither risk assessment alone, nor one just supplemented by assessment of socioeconomic impacts is sufficiently adequate. Uh, and and uh, many um, organizations have actually called for technology assessment to have make, put a technology assessment approach to gene drive organisms. And by technology assessment, I'm not talking about just evaluating a technology, in this case, gene drives. Uh, per se, on its own uh, merits, you know. But really, it's about the contextual uh, perspective that is important because we need a broad technology assessment that allows for consideration of the appropriateness of the technology compared with other means to achieve the same goals or to address a stated problem. So again, here is, um, I think, um, what was highlighted earlier, what Tamara said, that we don't start from the technology, but we start from addressing what is the problem that needs to be addressed. And when we do that, and we looked at all the things in that mix, and we look at that, and if there are other less risky alternatives that can uh, provide the same answers or provide this, um, the same sorts of solutions, then it would make logical sense to go for the less risky alternative. Part of the technology assessment approach is also uh, very much rooted in inclusiveness and in enabling public participation. Uh, um, in, in the literature, they talk about broadening the inputs and the outputs. So broadening the inputs meaning from many, many different stakeholders and expertise, but in particular, uh, privileging those who are marginalized, those who are directly affected, for example and to broaden the outputs in different policy processes. And I think having a more holistic approach uh, beyond risk assessment or just socioeconomic assessment, but adopting a broader technology assessment approach uh, would be very beneficial uh, for gene drive organisms. Um, we also need um, rigorous monitoring and detection uh, because once released, of course, gene drive organisms can't be withdrawn in a biological sense. So if there is ever the case that um, a gene drive organism is released, there would be a need to track its movements and the potential spread to populations across borders and ecosystems. There would also be a need to uh, look at and identify unintended harmful impacts during and after a GDO release. Um, and as well as to ensure that we have, there are detection methods available, even for those that are in research and development at the moment, so that any unintentional uh, release or unintentional movements can be tracked. Um, finally, uh, the issue of liability and redress. Um, we came to the conclusion that the, really the minimum requirement for gene drive organisms would be an international civil liability regime with a strict liability standard. Now, there's none uh, at the moment um, that is in place for G GMOs, 
we have an international law, the Supplementary Protocol on Liability and Redress, which is a supplement to the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety, uh, but it, and it's an international legally binding instrument, but it does have its limitations. Uh, it, it, it's a very, it operates on the basis of an administrative uh, approach to liability, uh, which means that um, competent authorities uh, take response measures when there is damage uh, to the environment in this case. Yeah? Uh, but it's not a process by which, for example, we have an international regime that allows uh, uh, those who are responsible for the damage to be taken to court and cases to proceed on that basis. We don't have something international on, uh, for that. Although there are provisions within the supplementary protocol that encourages um, parties to uh, utilize or develop their national civil liability laws and to review this provision. Um, so this is still very much um, some, a conversation that needs to be had. Uh, secondly, uh, while the supplementary protocol um, has a strict liability standard, um, um, you know, and this would be important. Now, strict li liability basically means that uh, it's not fault-based, right? You don't have to show uh, a duty of care, you don't have to prove a breach of the duty of care, and you don't have to prove that damage um, has been caused by that breach of duty of care. What happens in the strict liability regime, you would just need to show that there has been damage, and that there is a causal link between the GMO or the GDO uh, with that damage. And so basically it reverses the burden of proof and it's much more in line with a precautionary uh, principle and precautionary approach. Um, the other important point to make is that uh, the issue of financial security, uh, even under the existing supplementary protocol on liability and redress, uh, has not been fully addressed yet. It's there as a enabling provision, it still needs to be discussed uh, by uh, parties and to decide what to do about this. Uh, and we feel that this would be important. Financial security from the developers uh, is absolutely necessary because that has to underpin any liability and redress regime because you, even if um, someone is found liable, if there's no financial security, you may not have the means uh, to be able to provide for the redress or the compensation. So these are still, as you can see, uh, quite a lot of gaps uh, that still need to be addressed uh, in, uh, internationally. Um, I'm just going to very quickly um, go through, I don't know how much time I have. Um, let's see, okay. I'm just very quickly going to address uh, the COP decision. Now, the CBD um, met in 2018 and uh, adopted a decision uh, specifically addressing gene drive organisms. Uh, you may be aware that many civil society organizations were calling for a moratorium on environmental release on gene drive organisms. The parties uh, did not decide on an explicit moratorium. However, they did put some strict precautionary conditions uh, in place, and they said that these conditions should be met before any introduction into the environment of gene drive organisms, including for experimental or research and development purposes. Now, the conditions are stipulated in the decision relate to carrying out risk assessments, to having in place risk management measures, and to obtaining the free prior informed consent of potentially affected indigenous peoples and local communities. Now, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of risk assessments, uh, we don't have any, and risk management, we don't have any um, international guidance on this yet. Uh, we have many gaps and uncertainties, uh, methodological and data limitations. And in terms of free prior and informed consent um, for gene drive, there's nothing specific uh, developed internationally uh, in relation to gene drive um, organisms. So, you know, these are very much um, in a sense, I guess you could say they are motherhood statements, but we need to be able to flesh them out uh, a lot more. Um, but just to, just to also point out that the COP14 decision had a footnote, which recalls previous decisions laying out additional elements that should apply to gene drive organisms. Uh, these are listed here, I'll just go through them very quickly uh, to say that you have to have effective regulatory systems uh, to ensure that you do not cause extraterritorial damage to the environment of other states. To be able to address issues such as food security, socio-economic considerations with full participation of indigenous peoples and local communities. Uh, to uh, the footnote, I mean, when you look at previous decisions and you refer to precautionary approach, 
it really establishes the right to take precautionary measures, even in a situation where scientific knowledge is lacking. And this could, of course, uh, be up to parties. It could include bans and moratoria and the like. Um, to have environmental impact assessment, allowing for public participation in such procedures, uh, to deal with the consequences of extraterritorial impacts, uh, to have procedures for immediate notification uh, and action to prevent imminent or grave danger or damage beyond national jurisdiction. So very much applicable to gene drive organisms which um, you know, will move uh, beyond national borders. Uh, to have in place emergency responses, international co cooperation for joint contingency plans, um, and to examine liability and redress, including restoration and compensation for damage to biodiversity. Finally, um, there is also a footnote that refers uh, to the issue of uh, free prior and informed consent. As I mentioned previously, um, it refers to a particular voluntary guidelines which have been adopted by parties to the CBD, um, which uh, applies to uh, the sharing of knowledge, innovations and practices of Indigenous people in local communities. But there's nothing similar uh, at the international level uh, in relation to gene drive organisms. Uh, we feel that at a minimum, the details, uh, which at least puts in place the principles of what must be done when you're seeking free prior and informed consent of local communities and indigenous peoples, what should be done. These details are set out in the guidelines and they should be met at a minimum. Uh, as well as, of course, we know that uh, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples sets the international standards and norms on this issue. So I can say that uh, within the CBD, of course, as you can see, they have started to address this issue, but very much still, um, I would say, at the beginning phases. And we feel there are a lot of gaps too that need to be addressed. And we need effective international rules that are binding on all countries before for any release of gene drive organisms. And unfortunately, these are not yet in place. Uh, we can have a good start with the 2018 decision of the CBD parties and the previous decisions that, as I showed you, all taken all together, do set, uh, do raise the bar in terms of before any consideration even of a release of the gene drive organisms. These aspects are the minimum that need to be taken into account. There are precautionary obligations that parties would need to be comply with, as well as we would say, uh, because this issue is so important, that non-parties and developers uh, should also adhere to them in good faith. We still need the time to deliberate and put in place adequate processes and to pro properly address these conditions. Uh, to begin this discussion at an international level, uh, this has to be done. Uh, and if, if there are moves to release gene drive organisms before the appropriate regulation is in place, I think this at the end may be counterproductive because it will end up to be more costly, more time consuming and more politically uh, challenging. Uh, and I think the, the, the main point that we are making and we feel that are important steps to be made is really that we need um, as an international community uh, to, to take a, a pause and to say that, okay, there should be no releases into the environment, including field trials of any gene drive organism at this stage. That we need to um, develop at the international level strict contained use standards specific for gene drive organisms. Um, this, at the national level, we can apply them already to existing research and development in the lab, as well as uh, in terms of transport of any GDOs. Uh, we need to make sure that we have the systems in place for monitoring and detection for unintentional releases and unintentional transboundary movements because this is always a risk and a, um, a likelihood of happening even uh, with escapes uh, from laboratories um, settings for example and that we must have international rules for this constraint period including for its enforcement and liability and redress and they have to be effectively operational so basically the key message really from our presentation is that there are very particular challenges that are raised by gene drive organisms that are not being adequately addressed by um, the international legal and regulatory regime for GMOs uh, at the moment. And that uh, we need to um, uh, really um, have a pause at this stage in time and say we need to discuss, we need to debate this uh, parties to the CBD, to the protocol, we need to discuss this seriously and to address these 
uh, gaps that we have identified and to put in place the right elements to be able to say and to be able to uh, say that we can have a, a fit for purpose uh, regulation and legal and regulatory regime for gene drive organisms. Um, yeah, thank you very much. That, that ends my presentation. And um, I'll be happy to, of course, take questions. I come back. <laughs> right. Thank you very much, Ching. That was a brilliant presentation. It was very clear to me. Um, I hope it has been to the participants and um, I hope they have interesting questions. Let's see, let's take a look at the question box. We start right at the top. First question says, can you please comment on the cyber biosecurity risks of gene drives? This is a new discipline. Um, it's a crossover between cybersecurity and biosecurity. I think, Jing, you might be familiar with it, are you? Uh, I'm afraid I'm not. Um, I, maybe if you could explain a little bit more, uh, that, that might help me and I, I could try, but uh, I'm afraid I'm not able to comment on this. I only have an intuitive idea of it as yet because I've, I don't have much experience with it yet either. Um, but it's a kind of crossover between uh, the risks of um, life sciences and related technologies like genetic engineering and the risks of uh, digital technologies of which there are a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in your area, you might think of digital sequence information, for instance, that is specifically an area of cyber biosecurity, I think. Hmm. Yeah, I, I wouldn't really be able to comment on the risks, uh, and I'm not sure, you know, in terms of the specific case of gene drives, um, where where this would stem from. Uh, the issue of digital sequence information is, of course, uh, something that's also very currently hotly Discuss under the Convention on Biological Diversity. Um, hello, sweetie. I'm in a call. Thanks. Sorry, that was my son just come home from school. Um, but just to say that this issue is uh, being discussed uh, under the CBD and under Nagoya Protocol and Access and Benefit Sharing. Uh, uh, basically, um, uh, do you want to into the issue of DSI, um, Diedrich? Um. Yes, if, if you can say something about uh, what's being done about this digital sequence information in that respect. Yeah, uh, I mean, basically, in terms of what's being discussed under the CBD uh, and the Nagoya Protocol on access and benefit sharing is within the context of access and benefit sharing. So the idea that um, in the past, uh, for example, uh, a researcher could uh, get a sample of a plant or, you know, a virus uh, from a different country uh, and perhaps commercialize it or what we call in the, the CBD, utilize it, right? Uh, whether through research and development or through commercial applications uh, and then, uh, you know, obviously um, gain profit from it perhaps, uh, but there would be no benefit sharing back to the country or the communities that have been the providers of the resource. Uh, so in the terms of uh, the new technologies that are now being enabled uh, through synthetic biology uh, and the ability to now be able to, for example, synthesize, uh, say, um, small organisms, uh, you know, um, from just from the data without having access to the physical sample. The question then is that do you then also allow, uh, you know, is, and this is a big um debate that's happening in the CBD now uh, in terms of, yes, you could have um, um, benefit sharing apply to this as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, it's an important area, I think, and um, um, I know digital sequence information is getting more and more attention from the Biodiversity Convention and the Cartagena Protocol. Uh, I think there are um, more areas probably uh, within bio cyber biosecurity that um, 
the convention and the protocol should look at really because it's becoming a big area, um, particularly with claims that you can do genetic engineering without leaving any traces of it. If that would be true, then big questions arise, for instance, about the identity of organisms, of plants and animals. Are they what they are said to be? Are they natural ones or um, agriculturally cultivated ones? Or are they genetically engineered ones? If we can't see that, then uh, how do we properly identify them? That is what cyber, cyber biosecurity is, I think, or at least a part of it. As far as I understand it, I'm not a specialist. This has been introduced to me within NSAR, this area. Let's look at the next question. You said we should obtain the full consent of potentially concerned parties. How do we deal with this point, knowing that it could have a global or mondial impact? Who will be in charge of such questions? People, rulers, experts? I think, yeah, this is precisely, um, you know, what needs to be discussed, uh, which we haven't yet come to the point uh, of doing so at the international level. Um, how do we obtain the consent of potentially concerned parties? Now, um, in the case of treaties like the CBD, for example, then it would be the governments, right? Who are the uh, parties to the treaty. Uh, and uh, uh, if, for example, if you had a, an application or, or a particular intervention, uh, which could have uh, a regional impact. Let's just take the case of mosquitoes uh, as an example, because it's a current one and, and one that is quite, you know, further down the line. If there were developed gene drive mosquitoes uh, for malaria eradication uh, in Africa, in West Africa, for example, uh, how then would you be able to obtain the consent of all the neighboring countries if you were to release it in one particular country? Uh, how you know, what are the modalities for getting consent of all the countries that could be potentially affected? These are precisely the things that have not been discussed yet. Under the Cartagena Protocol, we only have a bilateral system that's in place, right? Uh, where between an importing and exporting country. Uh, so how do we do this? How do we put in place extended modalities? Uh, when do we do this? When should the timing be? All these questions still have yet to be discussed even, I would say. Uh, so we haven't even come to that point at the international level. And this would be important to discuss. Uh, you know, I, I think it, it would be absolutely uh, critical uh, because of that potential uh, for spread beyond national borders. Right. Thank you very much. The next question, the, this participant says, thanks a lot. Your slide on the international protocols would be very interesting. I thought that was a great overview. Um, I can say to that that it will be available in the recording of your webinar, won't it? Um, the question of this participant is, there is no judge having the power to enforce the Cartagena's protocol, question mark. Would there exist a way to force a national, national judge to apply this protocol nonetheless? Okay. Well, I mean, um, uh, for, for treaties like the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety, uh, there are parties and it's an international legally binding law, right? So parties, and there are about 172 countries in the world that are parties to this protocol. Uh, but it has to be implemented at the national level. And this is done, of course, through national laws. Uh, so many countries, for example, have developed national biosafety uh, acts that deal uh, with the subject matter of the Cartagena Protocol. The Carter Pro 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 Cartagena Protocol is an international minimum standard, right? So when countries uh, become parties, they, are, they do have obligations to implement the protocol through uh, legal, administrative, or other measures. Most countries choose to develop, enact a national law. Uh, and it's true that that, that, that gives it its legal weight. Then, of course, uh, within that country, then uh, courts uh, would be able to enforce uh, or to, you know, to, to make judgments and to, on, on such cases if they're brought under the law. Uh, so then it's really a question uh, where you have an international treaty that then has to be uh, domesticated at the national level uh, and of course when when countries do that they can set higher standards than what's in the Cartagena protocol. Right. This is clear. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. So if a country has ratified the protocol, then um, any rules that the protocol makes are binding to this country, right? Yeah. Um, that, that prompts a question to me, actually. Um, if a country is not recognized by the international community and by the United Nations, how does it deal with this? It has to deal with it by itself, doesn't it? Like Taiwan, I'm thinking of. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, there, there are cases like uh, that where uh, it, it cannot be a party to the protocols or the treaties because it's not a recognized United Nations uh, country. Um, uh, but of course, then Taiwan has its own national laws. Yeah. Which yeah. we do develop. And I know I want to. Ching, I notice your sound is getting worse. Um, maybe you should. Okay, shall I stop okay. my video then to make that a bit, um, perhaps that might improve it? Yeah. Does that help? Yes. Um, maybe repeat the last few sentences you said. Um, I, I was just saying in the case of the example you gave in Taiwan, uh, they do have national laws that deal with biosafety. As, as far as I can recall, I, I can't remember exactly whether it was a GM food labeling law or national biosafety law, but they do have uh, laws and regulations. So, of course, that's at the national level. And they can look to the Cartagena Protocol, uh, although they can't be a party to the Cartagena Protocol. China is, of course, a party to the Cartagena Protocol. Um, I'm not quite sure how that applies to these uh, special territories, but... Um, yeah, they, they, they definitely do have, it, at the domestic level at least, at the yeah. national level, uh, the laws in place for that. Yeah, yeah. But the, the majority of the world's countries uh, are, in the meantime, party to the Cartagena Protocol, aren't they? Yes, I think uh, a last count is about 171 parties. 101, okay. That's uh, 71, 171. 171, right. Yeah. Oh, that's... that's Eight, eight or nine. So that's most, most countries in the world. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's look at the next question that runs. Thanks, Ching, for such an excellent presentation. My question is on socioeconomic guidance and to what extent this will be usefully given, useful, to, to, to what extent, sorry, this will be useful given the current provision for socioeconomic consideration in the Cartagena protocol is still weak. What hope does it give us? Hmm. Yeah, I think yeah, it's true that uh, what's existing in the Cartagena protocol is it's not ideal. This was, of course, uh, a result of uh, compromise in the negotiations when the protocol was uh, negotiated. Uh, but, you know, I think what, what must happen then is that parties uh, can take this further. And indeed, you have, as uh, Deirdre, you mentioned in your introduction to Norway in its Gene Technology Act. The Norwegian Gene Technology Act very specifically includes uh, socioeconomic and ethical considerations in its law. And they have uh, gone further in developing uh, um, um, documents uh, that address this issue. Um, so I think we there is now um, a, um, guidance developed by the technical expert group, the ad hoc technical expert group that's available for everyone to use. Uh, and, and countries will really have to, you know, take, take it on at their national levels uh, because many countries, particularly um, 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 countries in African countries actually uh, have uh, socioeconomic, taking into account socioeconomic considerations as mandatory in their national laws. Uh, so I think this is a discussion that still must be had and, uh, you know, it, it will really take political will uh, from the countries uh, to be able to develop the ideas further, to learn from other, as we've always said in the discussions on socioeconomic considerations, to learn from other aspects. Uh, there are, um, you know, well-established disciplines uh, which take into account socioeconomic impact assessments, for example. Within the CBD itself, there's guidance uh, on socioeconomic aspects, uh, you know, of, of interventions that affect biological diversity, for example. So there are guidance documents available. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, I think there is some hope there, uh, but it will require a concerted effort. Right. Thank you.
Then the next question says, how to conciliate international binding decisions and joint decisions with national self-determination and priorities? Probably African countries may have more interest in developing GDOs for malaria. How can they progress? Okay, I think, um, you know, when we talked about, when I talked about joint decision making, um, it wasn't, uh, as I said, uh, it wasn't meant to be a antithetical, antithetical, sorry, to national uh, self-determination and priorities. Uh, the idea for joint decision making was to say that every country should have the right to decide for itself whether or not to give or withhold approval for a particular gene drive um, uh, intervention, right? Uh, so I don't think uh, they're necessarily mutually exclusive uh, because, of course, uh, at the national level, countries will have um, their own national uh, priorities uh, to, you know, it, that, that should be important. I think then this is a question then really at the international level, then how do we um, balance and how do we ensure that everyone's voice is heard uh, in these discussions? Um, yeah. All right, I can't hear. Diedrich, I think you're muted. I was, sorry. Uh, that's because I was trying to block the noise of ventilation of my computer. Um, the next question runs, inclusiveness might not be too good to have. Discussing of discussion gene, uh, discussing gene drives, among other things, might be a way to use propaganda in favor of gene drives. Moreover, mm -hmm. such discussions might accustom people with the idea of eradicating whole species. Do you not fear such risk? Gosh, um, I think, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, we, we operate very much by the principle of inclusiveness, uh, but also inclusiveness that specifically uh, takes into account uh, the voices and perspectives of those who are marginalised, of those who will be particularly impacted, for, of those who do not have the you know, normally the decision-making voice and power uh, as you normally have. Because to be quite honest, the, the, the discussion on gene drives um, has in quite often been the, well, I can say um, the domain of expertise, of experts, um, and not really about, you know, talking to indigenous peoples, for example, uh, to, to see how they conceptualize. And we've had now, at, uh, thankfully, in the last two meetings of the uh, technical expert group on synthetic biology representatives from indigenous uh, communities, because before that, they, they were not present in these discussions. And that quite sadly is often the case uh, where people who are marginalized, communities who are marginalized have not had the chance to, to voice their opinions. And that's brought in different perspective. For example, how they view nature, how indigenous peoples view nature, themselves as part of nature, uh, you know, and have very dis different conceptions. Uh, as in the case of, for example, when you talk about eradicating whole species, uh, that, that that is, you know, antithetical to their being and their knowledge. Um, so I think for me, um, of course, there's always a danger, you know, in the sense of, but I, I don't think, I think we need to open up debate. I need, I think uh, for something as important as this that could have such potential uh, far-reaching impacts, we need to have uh, as many people involved in these discussions as possible. Right. Thank you. And the next question says, the USA are not a member, a party to the Biodiversity Convention and the Cartagena Protocol. They declare genome edited organisms as not GMO, not genetically modified. Could you please comment on the chances to come to a binding agreement on gene drive organisms mm. with the USA, I take it? Yeah, well, it's true. and. That's one uh, key limit, one limitation of the CBD and the Cartagena Protocol. Of course, the US uh, is not a party to either treaty. 
Um, and, uh, you know, that's unfortunately the case uh, when it comes to GMOs as well, even though they are one of the largest developers and exporters of um, um, GMOs. So um, I think, but what happens and, and how this happens is, for example, if you look at the Cartagena Protocol, because most of the countries in the world uh, have become parties uh, to this protocol and they put in place the national laws to implement their obligations under the protocol. When the US, in the case of GMOs, wants to export to my country, Malaysia, which is party to the protocol, because I have a national law in place, the US will have to follow my national biosafety law. And I think it will work the same way with gene drive organisms. If the international community agrees, and we already have the legally binding instruments, the CBD and the Cartagena protocol and the supplementary protocol that deals with GMOs. The question is to um, either look at how we can, um, you know, uh, amend or maybe not even amend, but through decisions of the parties, uh, put in place the standards to deal with gene drive organisms, then the US would have to comply with that because it's implemented uh, at the point of each country's national laws. Um, so that's, you know, one way. But of course, yeah, it is, uh, you know, it is an issue that they're not a party to these uh, treaties. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. The next question says, thank you for your clear and interesting presentation. <coughs> As you point out, the idea of developing contained use regulations is an important aspect in gene drive discussions. You mentioned to begin at the national level who a broad discipline, specific ones, citizens, NGOs, etc. Who would you recommend to be part of this process? Um, well, yeah, I think uh, that's important. Uh, in what, well, obviously, at the national level, uh, you know, the, when it comes to developing biosafety laws and regulations, and that would include the contained use regulations, it's very much been the recommendation that, um, you know, that the, ex the, the, the breadth of expertise that is brought in is broad, that is not just molecular biologists, for example, it's that we include ethicists, that we include ecologists, that we include citizens, farmers, uh, civil society organizations. I think that that is important and in line with what I said earlier about the principle of inclusivity. Yeah. So in many cases, of course, uh, when I think back to the process of how in my country, when we developed our national law on biosafety, uh, you know, we, we did um, have these discussions uh, and try to broaden it, not always perfectly, of course, but uh, the idea was that to, 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 to bring, um, you know, as broad um, uh, a level of expertise as possible, and while also recognizing that the expertise also lies in farmers, with ind indigenous peoples, with civil society organizations. Yeah. There was a second part to this question, actually, um, which runs, realistically, do you see this as a continuum, eventually, to move to international standards as well? And if so, how would this kind of process begin from the national level to um, the national level? I would actually not... I would actually see it as parallel processes because we feel that contained use is really something that hasn't been actively discussed or taken up as much uh, in the discussions on gene drive organisms. And we feel that that's important. Uh, is this an important gap that needs to be addressed? Uh, uh, and our proposal was that we could use national law already be because many countries have biosafety laws that include contained use uh, issues. So they could, uh, uh, you know, that, that discussion has to be had at the national level, as well as at the international level, we need to begin a process uh, uh, likely, you know, possibly within the convention or within the protocol uh, to, to try and talk about this issue of the international standards. So, so I, I would see it as, as parallel processes that need to be done. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, at this point, I'd like to insert a small question of my own, if I may, um, even though we're running a bit over time. Um, do you mind, Ching, uh, taking a bit extra time? Uh, sure, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. Um, I'll try to be as short as possible. Yeah, um, yeah. My question was, um, uh, how could any risk assessment measures for gene drives deal with the big dilemma of gene drives, the dilemma that any trial really amounts to the deployment of the gene drive already 
um, as opposed to contained use. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I wouldn't be able to comment on the science of it, but I know this is a big issue and has been discussed, uh, for example, with the technical expert group. Uh, the point that, uh, you know, if you're releasing it, and in fact, the synthetic biology um, art uh, release uh, to the environment could be irreversible. And that even if you're doing or planning to do um, experiments in islands, which might, some might... Hang, hang on, sorry to, sorry to interrupt you. Please repeat your last few sentences because they dropped away. Ah, okay, yeah. So I was just saying that, um, in fact, this was already raised by the um, uh, expert group on synthetic biology when they said that any release to the environment uh, is irre be irreversible in the case of gene drives. Uh, so that means that, of course, uh, and this was discussed in the recent RTEC meeting, that applying this phase approach where you go from lab to field trial to, you know, a full-scale release, uh, doesn't quite work uh, for gene drive organisms. And these are discussions that still have to be had because uh, in, in the way that the international discussions are at the moment, parties will ha first have to decide uh, whether to, to, to develop guidance and then set up a mandate and an expert group to deal with this issue. So I think these are going to be very, very live conversations uh, that still must happen. And I guess my point at the end of it, uh, when I said is that we are still in a sense at the beginning stage when we talk about legal and regulatory aspects and we need really to have this pause uh, where there are no releases uh, at present so that we can have the time and space to deliberate these very important issues. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we're nearly done with the questions. The next one goes, thanks for your presentation. The precautionary principle approach was emphasized during your talk. Can you comment on collective rights in relation to it? Corporation rights are not questioned. Mm, okay. Collective so, rights. I think, I mean, obviously that's, a, in, a, in a sense, a bigger um, question. Um, uh, you know, obviously the, pre the precautionary principle is one that is emphasized and has been taken into account very much in environmental decision making, uh, particularly in, in the European um, and, and other countries as well. Um, the, I think uh, on the issue of rights, uh, collective rights, well, you know, one thing that we can look at, for example, is the UN Declaration on Indigenous Peoples' Rights, also the UN Declaration on uh, Peasants' Rights, which have been recently adopted. Now, these very much refer to collective rights, particularly when we talk about Indigenous people. So it's a different conception, right? And I think uh, if we talk about corporations and the rights of corporations and regulating that, um, you know, in one sense, they're not necessarily the domain of the CBD or the um, Cartagena Protocol, but there are discussions. For example, in, in, uh, there are negotiations ongoing at the moment for a legally binding treaty to address uh, the, um, um, sorry, uh, with human rights impacts of transnational, the activities of transnational corporations. So there are different instruments uh, in the international legal landscape that attempt to deal with different parts of this. And I think, um, yeah, perhaps where it all comes together uh, at the national level when countries put in place their legal frameworks is to look at all these different examples that are out there and take um, the standards and incorporate them in national law. I think that's probably the best, you know, that, that we could hope for. Okay, thank you. The next question says, you did not mention anything about regulation needing to be case by case. How do you align this principle with global frameworks that by definition aren't taking context into account? And if they needed to address every type of gene drive systems, would be extremely complex. Mm. Okay. Um, well, I mean, in terms of um, uh, the, the risk assessment process that's applied to GM organisms, um, it's very much been on a case-by-case -case basis. But I think when we talk about gene drives, uh, you know, there, there are, within the protocol, for example, uh, there is a leeway for parties to identify particular GMOs um, that 
uh, could cause adverse effects and identify how to deal with them, for example. And gene-derived organisms may be a specific one when you say, okay, you know, there could be uh, uh, arguments for doing so. To, to the, but I don't think in the one sense they're not mutually exclusive because we do need to have these global frameworks. We do need to have an international regulatory system. And very much though, when we looked at, um, the, and we made the argument in, 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 in our book chapter that uh, we are looking really at the, in a sense, worst case scenarios because the law has to be anticipatory and prepared for these worst case scenarios. Then, of course, you may have exclusions and, you know, contextual, um, you know, um, differentiation, um, you know, when you come to apply the law. But as the law, as when it's being designed and putting a framework in place, it has to be able to be able to be prepared to regulate uh, the case of global gene drives. Of course, it may be the case that in future, as far as I know, many of the um, proposed uh, local um, gene drives or the self, uh, the ones that are limiting are, are not yet, uh, have not yet been empirically demonstrated. They are very much theoretical at this stage. Uh, so we really have to be able to have a framework that anticipates uh, what all the potential scenarios are and the, 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 the impacts and the events that could happen and, and, and then to work from there. Yeah. Thank you, Jing. The next question runs, could regional harmonization of biosafety protocols be able to deal with the issue of prior informed consent when it comes to the release of gene drive organisms, especially where these are lacking at a national level? I, I suppose that could theoretically be possible, uh, but I... I think I would again emphasize the main point I made that when it comes to uh, what this idea of joint decision making uh, that we talked about, it is not, not about a regional entity making a decision on behalf of countries in the region because that wouldn't be, uh, the, that, that would then not apply the principle that we want to operationalize, which is in terms that every country would have to have a right uh, to have a say in the decision making that goes on. I, I hope that was clear. Yeah, yeah. Okay, next question. Um, theoretically, financial liability is good. Yet, for instance, in France, the liability for nuclear plants is up to the state. But it made a law that gives the upper limit, 90 million euros, <coughs> a very high limit. So there's no real liability. Asking financial liability is good, but not enough. Okay, so I think uh, this was the point I made in terms of that there is a need for financial security, uh, which uh, is something that is envisioned in the uh, Nagoya uh, Kuala Lumpur Supplementary Protocol on Liability and Redress. And parties are supposed to do a study on this and to address this issue because during the negotiations, they were not able to come to an agreement on this point. Uh, I mean, uh, perhaps you're right, it's, it may not be good enough, but it's a starting point because at the end of the day, if uh, we don't have systems or mechanisms by which developers of GMOs or GDOs provide financial security or insurance or you know something to that effect then we will come to a stage where when damage happens or if damage happens and you want to compensate you want to you know restore biodiversity or redress then it would be the state that ends up paying it so at least if you have a system whereby a fund and this is the case I think with the oil um, pollution fund right uh, in terms of uh, they, they all pay into a fund, the, the big companies, they pay into a fund and that fund is there to be used when damage occurs. So these, there are, I think, models out there that we can look at for good examples whereby we, the, to, we need to just safeguard this point that when there is damage, uh, there should be redress, right? And then and you're not able to have redress if you don't have the financial ability uh, to, to be able to do so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hard to organize it, but uh, we can't do without it. It's mm. essential. The next question, that's the penultimate one. Are there any examples of gene drive products that were applied under field conditions and later identified as harmful to the ecosystem or biodiversity? I think the answer okay, there, there are 
no uh, uh, gene drive organisms that have been released yet into the environment. Um, so we are not at that stage yet. Uh, and what we are saying is that we really need to, I mean, get our act together, whether in terms of uh, addressing the scientific questions, whether in terms of having the wide societal debate that is needed, or whether in terms of having the right regulatory systems in place. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and the last question, through the regulatory process, how would you balance the scientific assurances often lacking facts on gene drives and public expectations and concerns when approving a gene drive? Regulatory decisions often weigh heavily on science over public concerns. Yeah, and I think that's, that's quite true. Uh, I think in, through the regulatory process, I would say that this has to then be um, uh, done through um, efforts or through efforts that require public participation, uh, that require, um, you know, taking into consideration uh, the different views of the public and to have mechanisms that are actually effective uh, for public participation. Um, and I, I think one useful example really is the Aarhus uh, Convention and uh, the specific GMO amendment that it has developed as well, uh, which gives public, you know, in terms of right to access to information, right to be able to participate in decision-making processes, uh, and, and to be able to have access to justice. Um, of course, these things are not perfect, uh, and the law can only go so far. But if you can put provisions in place uh, that deal with this issue of public participation, then I think that, that we'll be in a better position. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, are there actually any governments in the world, Ching, um, who have started making any legal provisions for gene rights? Uh, no, I'm not aware of any. I sorry. Yeah, no, that you know of, I said. Uh, yeah, I think um, there may be. Uh, I'm not sure where this has gone, but I did read something about maybe Nigeria uh, trying to include it in its biosafety law. I'm not sure if that's been, you know, adopted or not. But I guess then, then there is the the question. I mean, you know, of well, you. Know, being able to develop a robust regime that is really precautionary uh, as opposed to, for example, in some cases uh, where sometimes biosafety laws are seen as just being permissive uh, to the release of GM organisms, for example. But I think that those are questions for every country. Um, and I think, yeah, we haven't come to that stage yet in terms of gene drive organisms specifically, but quite clearly they are covered under biosafety laws. Yeah. Well, it would be great if Nigeria was the first to do it. Um, that was it. Uh, no more questions left. Um, thank you so much, Ching. Um, Ching. It must be a weird experience to give a talk without seeing who <laughs> is listening to you. Um, yes. And uh, the drawback is that you cannot hear any applause if it would be there. But I think if I look at the chat that you might have got some applause if people would have been able to because Here's one person who says, excellent presentation. Thanks so much, Ching. And, oh, there's another one actually who says something else. I have some questions, but we'll send them to all panelists by email. So we'll sure, get some questions fine. by email. Thank you again, she says. And uh, she will write to the panel about the very related problems we're currently having in the UK due to the Brexit. That will be interesting to hear. Another participant says, thank you on such an excellent cycle of webinars. That goes for the whole cycle then. Excellent presentation, excellent Zoom web platform. That's for you, Lucas. Hope it would continue. Um, well, not on gene drives for the moment, but uh, Enser certainly plans to give further webinars. So we'll let you know about that. Another participant says, thank you for this excellent presentation. The whole set of presentation has been very informative. Pia Kaha, she adds, I don't know what that language, what language that is and what it means. And another participant actually says, I think the ECOWAS draft regulations have included synthetic biology, but it doesn't go far to provide, it doesn't go so far as to provide guidelines on gene drive organisms. That's maybe informative to you, Ching. One other person says, congratulations, Jing. Um, 
Oh, and the ECOWAS regulations are draft biosafety regulations. This is a final edition. I think that's it. Thank you very much again to our speaker, Lindy Ching. Thank you to all participants for listening attentively and asking so many interesting questions. This was the last of our series of Gene Drive webinars. And as I just said, ENSER may give more webinars um, with or without our partners. Um, we hope to keep you informed of that. Um, but keep an eye on our website, ENSER.org. You will find announcements of them there. Thank you very much again. Bye for now. Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you for everyone to staying on also beyond the time. So it's been a pleasure. Thanks to the organizers. Bye. Bye bye, Chin. Bye.